21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. Shooting where? What subway station? Or what is it, a robbery? A what? Who is this? You're in the muster room at the 21st Precinct, the nerve center. A call is coming through. You will follow the action taken pursuant to that call from this minute until the final report is written in the 124 room at the 21st Precinct. All right. Tell them I'm sending more officers in the ambulance. Yeah, that's right. The ambulance and more police officers. They'll be right there. Yeah, right away. 21st Precinct. It's just lines on a map of the city of New York. Most of the 173,000 people wedged into the nine-tenths of a square mile between Fifth Avenue and the East River wouldn't know if you asked them that they lived or worked in the 21st. Whether they know it or not, the security of their homes, their persons, and their property is the job of the men of the 21st Precinct. The 21st, 160 patrolmen, 11 sergeants, and four lieutenants of whom I'm the boss. My name is Kennelly, Frank Kennelly. I'm captain in command of the 21st. I was working my night tour, 4 p.m. to 8 a.m. It was a busy night in the precinct. At 9.20 p.m., Patrolman Joseph McGill rang in, stating that he had reason to believe there was a dice game in progress in the rear of a barber shop on his post. The desk officer, Lieutenant Harry L. Snyder, conveyed this information to me, and I instructed him to notify the 6th Division plainclothes men, whose job it is to enforce the laws relating to public morals in the 21st and other precincts of the division. At five minutes after 10 p.m., Deputy Inspector Elias Zimmerman and four plainclothesmen arrived in the precinct to act on the information. With the assistance of Patrolman McGill, two men from Sector Car Number 2, and myself, the suspected premises were raided. A dice game was, in fact, in operation. Seventeen men were placed under arrest. The patrol wagon was summoned, and they were brought to the station house for booking. The muster room was swarming with suspects and police officers. As Lieutenant Snyder took the pedigree of the first suspect and entered it into the arrest record, I stood behind the desk. All right, now keep it quiet. Where do you think you are? All right, who's first? This one. Step right up there. What's your name? What's the traffic, huh, Captain? Yeah. Joe Mappin. First name is Joseph? Joseph, yeah. What's your middle name? Joseph C. The middle name, not the initial. Carl. Joseph Carl Mappin. All right, now let's keep it quiet. C-A-R-L? That's right, C-A-R-L. How do you spell the last name? M-A-P-P-I-N. Look, I want to get this straight. I wasn't shooting crap. I was in the barber shop to get a haircut. You can ask anybody. How old are you? 32 in March. Where do you live? 3420 Florence Avenue. In the Bronx? All right, I don't want to... In the Bronx, yeah. Keep it quiet. What do you work at? Electrician. Uh, I'll be in my office, Lieutenant. Uh, electrical yes, contract. Take everything out of your pockets and put it on the desk. Oh, uh, Sergeant, I'll be in my office. Yes, sir. Oh, see what that woman wants, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Uh, lady, over here, please. Everything money, too? Excuse me. I didn't want to be any trouble. What can I do for you? Get it down. Keep I want to talk to someone, a policeman. What about? Cigarettes, too? You want them out there? Well, I, I don't know how to... Excuse me. Yes, all right. Pocket. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. How much I got there? $52.20. Lieutenant Snyder's busy now. What'd you find there? Yeah? All right. Uh, wait just a second, will you? It'll be just a minute, lady. All right, don't worry. Keep it quiet. Uh, Captain, would you mind handing me that aided card on the desk there? Which one? Uh, that's it, sir, right there. There you are. Thanks, Captain. He's in Roosevelt Hospital with a possible fractured leg. All right, leg. You take the call, Sergeant. Uh, I'll talk to the lady. Yes, sir. I'm Captain Kennelly. Uh, how do you do? Uh, it's awfully busy here. Supposing you step into my office, hmm? Oh, all right. My wife lives in the 67th precinct. Hold on a minute. I, I don't mean to call. be any bother. 21st precinct. In here, please. Is it like that all the time? So busy? Not all the time, no. Uh, would you sit down? Uh... Uh, Mrs. Toppin, Mrs. Eva Toppin. Ah, would you sit down, Miss Toppin? Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, what can we do for you? 
You know how many times I walked past the police station, how many times before I came in? What's the trouble, Miss Thompson? Oh, trouble, all right. So much trouble, I don't sleep nights. I don't sleep nights for two weeks. What? Instead of coming into the police station, maybe I should have kept right on walking by. Uh, but you're in now. Yes, I'm in. Please sit down. Yeah. You, uh, want to tell me about it? All right. But I'm married 15 years, going on 16. If I tell you, I might as well move out. If I don't move out, I'll get kicked out. 15 years. It's something about your husband? Yes. I know. About his brother. Well, what's the trouble with him? Crazy. Insane. Well, Mrs. Toppin, that's not our job. He shot his wife. Killed her. Oh? Crazy. When did this happen? Six, seven weeks ago. I don't know. Where? At his home, Brooklyn. He came home one night and took a shotgun. The shotgun he used to hunt ducks. He shot her. She was dead. Why did he shoot her? No reason. He's crazy. Well, he must have thought he had a reason. Well, he said she was running around. He said she ran around with all different men. He said it for years. Was she? No, nothing. She stayed home all the time. A nice woman. Just scared all the time. Scared he was going to kill her. And he did. What's his name? Who? Oh, my husband? His brother. Well, just like my husband's top. And my husband's John. He's Fred. Where is he now? Fred? Yeah. I don't know right now. Well, wasn't he arrested? They didn't catch him yet. Are they looking for him? Oh, sure, yeah. They knew right away it was him that killed her. It was his gun. The lady downstairs from them heard the shot. She came out in the hall. He was running down the stairs. He ran down the stairs and out in the street. And they haven't caught him yet? No. Uh, this was in Brooklyn six or seven weeks ago? Yes, Brooklyn. Well, the police have been working on it, haven't they? Oh, sure, all the time. From as soon as she was shot. A detective came to our house and told us about it. We went to Brooklyn with him, to some police station there. We went to the place where they had her laid out in a, a what, what do you call it, morgue. They asked us a lot of questions. Does your uh, husband have any other brothers and sisters? No, just, just him, Fred. So a day or two goes by and he still isn't caught. They went to a funeral and everything like that. There were detectives at the funeral, too. The same detectives that talked to us. They said they thought maybe Fred would come, but he didn't. After the funeral, one of the detectives came to our house. He waited there, and then another detective came and also waited. Uh, have they still got detectives planted at your house, Mrs. Toppin? Planted? What do you mean, planted? Well, are they still waiting there? Oh, no. After ten days, so maybe two weeks, one of them came in for a cup of coffee with me and John. He said, uh, the detective, they thought Fred had gone away from town, Pennsylvania, someplace. They said they wouldn't wait at our house anymore. I see. Well, uh, what's the problem now, Mrs. Thompson? The problem is, John heard from Fred. Oh? Fred called John on the telephone at his place of business two weeks ago. Didn't John call the detectives? No. Well, why didn't you? I didn't know. I didn't know till the day before yesterday. I went to put money in the savings account. I saw $200 was taken out. $100 once and $100 again. When John came home, I showed him the bank book. He told me his brother called him on the job and told him he needed money. He called him twice for money. And twice he went to the bank and got it out. $100 each time. Why didn't he get in touch with the detectives? He wouldn't do anything against his brother. Oh, but you said he's out of his mind. I say he's out of his mind, yes. The detectives say he's out of his mind. Everybody says he's out of his mind. Everybody except John. John don't believe it. He sticks up. His brother could kill three wives and rob four banks, and to John he'd still be all right. It's a loyalty. Stick up for the family. Doesn't he realize that his brother's liable to get violent with him? How could he realize that if he don't realize he's crazy? Yes, I see your point. I can't mention it around the house. One word that anything is wrong with Fred makes John mad. He thinks it's a reflection on him. He thinks people will say runs in the family. He's insane, too. He should realize it. They asked him who's kidding who. Wasn't Fred in Harlem State Hospital for two years? I asked him why did they send him there. He said to get a rest. What are you going to do with something like that? You can't even talk to him about the subject. Well, why didn't you come and see us or call the Brooklyn detectives before? Because before he'd already seen Fred and the money was gone and so was Fred, so what good would it do? 
It just kept me in a big argument with John, that's all. And now? Well, I noticed today the bank book was gone again. He took it when he went to work. I see. It was back after supper. Back where we keep it all the time, the drawer with his socks. Another hundred dollars was withdrawn out. You think he saw his brother during the day? No. Why not? Because also after dinner he went to paint the pipes under the sink. He took off his good pants and put on his old pants. The hundred dollars was still in his good pants. Well, then you think, Mrs. Tarpin, that he hasn't seen his brother yet. I don't think it. I know it. Well, maybe he's seeing him tonight. No. Tonight, right now, he's playing seven-card rummy with a neighbor in the neighbor's flat downstairs. Where did you say you were going? 36th Street to the movie. That didn't make him suspicious? Why? Whenever he plays rummy, I go to the movies. I see. Uh, what time does he expect you home? 11.15, 11.30, when he finishes the rummy game. All right. In the meantime, I'd like to take you upstairs to talk to the detectives here. If you want, all right. Now? Yes, please. Mm -hmm. Captain. Yes? I don't want you to think this is because John took $300 from the bank to give to his brother. I didn't say I thought that. $300 takes a long time to save. To give it to a maniac that goes around killing wives is not right. I'm loyal also, but there is a time and a place to do the right thing. That's what I made up my mind. Enough is enough. Don't worry about it, Mrs. Thompson. He won't draw any more out of the bank. You are listening to 21st Precinct, a factual account of the way police work in the world's largest city. When you sign up for a course or series of courses with the United States Armed Forces Institute, you're getting the same education normally available in civilian schools and colleges. USAFI is under the direct supervision of an office of the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Education and Manpower, with outstanding civilian educators who work with military leaders in the formulation of plans for USAFI. A civilian agency evaluates and makes academic credit recommendations for USAFI courses. This aids schools and colleges in granting credit for educational work done with USAFI. As a result of this cooperation, USAFI courses are based on those available from civilian institutions as well as the needs of the armed forces. So, increase your power through knowledge with USAFI. Now back to 21st Precinct and Captain Frank Kennelly. I took Mrs. Tarpin upstairs to the 21st Detective Squad and into the office of Lieutenant Matt King, commanding officer of the squad. There she went through substantially the same story she had told me. As Lieutenant King and one of his detectives began to question the woman in greater detail, I left and walked down the worn stairs through the back room and out into the muster room. The crapshooters were still being booked at the desk as I went into my office and closed the door. At my desk, I dug deeper into the pile of reports and communications to be signed in time for the precinct messenger to take them to division headquarters with the morning mail. Yeah? Oh, come in. I'll keep it quiet. Hello, man. Yeah, what's going on out there? It's like a convention. It is. Convention of crap shooters. Oh? How many of them did you bag? Seventeen. Sit down, man. Thanks. Is that all? The others are plain clothesmen from division. Oh. Well, Lieutenant Snyder is going to have writer's cramp before he's finished with that hole. Yeah. Say, uh, what do you think of this Mrs. Tarpin story, Matt? It looks pretty good, Captain... Oh? I called out to the 62nd Squad. Uh-huh. They had such a case. Fred Tarpin, the husband of the dead woman, is still a fugitive. The squad commander wasn't there. His assistant was on the job. He told me they suspected the man might turn up at his brother's. As a matter of fact, I remember they spoke to me a month or so ago that they were going to put a plan on an apartment building here in this precinct. Well, uh, where are you going from here, man? Well, it's their case, Captain. This acting Lieutenant Eric Hertz I spoke to, and a man from Brooklyn West Homicide are on the way over now. What are they going to do? Put a tail on the husband to see if he takes the money to Fred? Well, we thought we might do that at first, Captain, but we decided over the phone to pick him up tonight. Well, why? If this John Tarpin is anything like his wife says, you're taking a chance. He might just shut up. The other way, it'd probably lead you to Fred. Well, we thought it out pretty much, Captain. He might have had a date to meet his brother today and missed him. We could tail him around for two or three weeks before they make contact again. Yeah, maybe, man. Well, what I want to see about, Captain, is I sent a Luca Novak over to the flat a little while ago to pick up Mr. Tarpin and bring him in. The wife's upstairs. Thought maybe I could talk to him in here for a few minutes before I took him up to the squad, if you're not too busy. 
Yeah, that's all right, man. I told the sergeant on T.S. to ring in here when I get back to the house with him. Or I can wait out in the muster room. No, no, stay where you are. Oh, uh, Mrs. Toppin told me he was playing cards in a neighbor's flat. Yes, sir, she told me. I got the name and location from her. Oh, uh, I got something I want to show you. Huh? This, uh, my recommendation for departmental recognition of Patrolman Weber in, uh, in connection with the gunfight he and your Detective Cassidy had with those two hold-up men before Christmas. Oh, yes, I sent mine in on Cassidy yesterday. You ought to get commendations out of it, don't you think? Well, I want to take a commendation for Weber. Cassidy ought to do better. He ought to get honorable mention out of it. I wouldn't be surprised if he did. Excuse me, man. Yes. 21st Precinct, Captain Kennelly. Sergeant Ward is on TS, Captain. Is Lieutenant King in there? Yeah, he's right here. The Luca Nova, you here. He asked me to stop them when I got back to the house and ring in here. All right, hold on. Uh, Matt, DeLuca and Novak are out of TS. We'll ask them to come in, Captain, if it's all right. Sergeant, have them come in here. Yes, sir. In the captain's office. And, uh, Sergeant. Yes, sir. How are you doing out there with the dice players? The lieutenant's got about half of them booked in, Captain. It's slow. All right. Yes, sir. Come in. Come in, Louie. Go ahead, Mr. Toppin. Drag somebody away from a peaceful rummy game. Novak, you better go on up and catch while Whitey takes for his meal. Sit down here, Mr. Toppin. I know nothing. I told the detectives from Brooklyn I know nothing. I told this detective tonight I know nothing. I tell you I know nothing. You don't have to know anything to sit down, Mr. Toppin. This is Captain Kennelly. I'm Lieutenant King. How do you do? Hello. Mr. Tarpin, I don't suppose there's any need for me to tell you how important it is for us to apprehend your brother. Everybody's already told me. As important as it is for us, it's just as important for him. His safety is involved. And his health. There's nothing wrong with his health. There was never anything wrong with his health. He's as healthy as an ox. I think? As an ox. He looked well when you saw him, Yes, when I saw him a week before... Before his wife died. Do you think there's any doubt that he killed his wife? I think nothing. I only know what I know. It's been established beyond all doubt that he killed his wife, Mr. Tarpin. You know that. I don't know that. I was not there. But he did. Were you there, Captain? The evidence is quite conclusive, Mr. Tarpin. I don't get this for the evidence. Is that why you've seen your brother on several occasions? When? Since he's been a fugitive. Who said I saw my brother? Didn't you? Eva has been talking to you. You saw him on two of I know it was Eva. I know it was her because that's what I said to her. I saw him twice. Man can't even lie to his own wife without the police becoming involved. Why did you lie to your wife if it was a lie? Sure it was a lie because I had to tell her something she'd believe about what I did with the money. You know about the money, too? Yeah. Sure. Sure. Tell a woman a secret. I took the woman out of the... I took the money out of the bank for other personal reasons. What other personal reasons? To pay someone I owed. Who'd you owe my place of business, the shipping clerk. He takes bets on horses. I owed him. Two hundred dollars. Two hundred dollars, yeah. And why'd you draw it out of the bank a hundred dollars at a time if you owed him two hundred? Because I told him I'd pay him a hundred at a time. To settle the two hundred you owed? That's right. One and one is two. Then what was the other hundred drawn out today for? Oh, so she sneaked a look at the bank book tonight, too. Huh? Where is she? I could give her a piece of my mind, that woman. Is she here? What was the hundred today for, Mr. Tarpin? Also for the bookmaker? Yes, but you only owed him 200. I was trying to win back the 200, so I lost another 100 also. 300 altogether. That's what you paid him, is that right? 300, yes. Except I didn't pay him the last 100 yet. I still have it in my pocket. Do you want to see? No, that's all right. What's the name of this shipping clerk? The bookmaker? Yes, what's his name? Al. What's his last name? I don't know. You work in the same place? You don't know his last name? Well, we're in different departments. It's a big place. All right. We'll find it out. A woman who runs to the police with lies. Her husband tells a wife a lie about some money. She runs to the police. Did you ever hear anything so ridiculous? That's what's the matter with lying, Mr. Tarpin. Keeps getting people in trouble. The interrogation of John Tarpin continued for some minutes. Now, when was it? it was no, a difficult job for Lieutenant King. He needed did? information regarding the whereabouts yeah, of the man. killer, oh, but he could not afford to press too hard for fear that the witness would stop talking entirely. He skirted the subjects that were touchy to John Toppin and kept going over and over the ground previously covered in the hope that the witness would be hopelessly caught in the tangle of his own lies. It didn't work. At 11.15, Lieutenant King and Detective DeLuca left my office with John Toppin and took him out into the muster room where the process of booking the gamblers was continuing. I stood in the doorway of my office and watched them go into the back room, up the stairs to the second floor on their way to the office of the 21st Detective Squad. All right, Mr. Tarpin, inside. You have to be at work at 8 in the morning. I hope you're not... Eve, family secrets. 
family secrets, you tell them, huh? Family secrets about a wife killer? Right. Family secrets. About a maniac? About the maniac part and the wife killer part don't bother. All right, let's settle down. It's the money, the $300. You are crazier than he Mr. is. Topper. He is not crazy. Louis, just get it through your head. Now, Mr. Topper, I got please. enough through my head already. He is not crazy. Now, Mr. Topper. Now, let me go. I can talk to my own wife. Your wife, yes, but not for long. What do you mean, not for long? I mean, not for long. Only for as long as it takes me to pack my clothes and go to my sister. If, uh, after 15 years? After 15 years. Why? Because I can't live with a man who don't know right from wrong. Even after 50 years. It's right. I know it's right. How do you know what he's doing? Maybe he's killing somebody else. Maybe right this minute. If, uh, please. Please, not after 15 years. Sit down, Mr. Tarpin, please. I'm no. not going to sit down. Sit down, Eva, please. I'll talk to him. I'll tell him. All right. If you'll tell him, I'll sit down. I, I met him, yes, twice. He called at my place of business, and he said he needed some money. I went to the bank and got it. And he called again, more money. Where's he living? I don't know. I didn't ask. You have more money for him now, don't you? Yes, he called on the telephone yesterday. Another hundred dollars. I took it out of the bank today. When are you supposed to give him that? Tonight, midnight. Where? He told me to be on the subway platform, the 77th Street station. He's to get off the train and meet me at midnight. You'll be met. He's got a gun, a pistol. He said he'd shoot. He'd, he'd shoot anybody. He don't care. He said if I didn't get him the money, he'd hold up places and shoot the people. That's why I got it. I didn't want anybody to get shot. That's why. John. Poor John. I'm Sorry. I'm sorry, too. I'm very sorry. You'll be on the subway platform, John. We'll all meet him. No, no, no. I'm not going. Not me. We need you to point him out. Not me. I won't point out my own brother. Don't ask me to do it, please. Let me be that loyal. All right. We'll get him without you. Arrangements were begun immediately to plant the 77th Street subway station of the Lexington Avenue line in order to apprehend the fugitive when he stepped off the train at midnight. Lieutenant King conferred with me and requested assistance in the form of members of my command to cover the stairs leading to the street on both the uptown and downtown sides of the station. Additional detectives were called in from the 19th and 23rd squads to aid in covering the subway platform. Detectives from the 62nd and homicide squads in Brooklyn arrived. With them, they brought photographs of Fred Tarpin. All the men assigned studied these pictures. Before leaving for the plant, Lieutenant King informed all members of the detail that Fred Tarpin was armed and apparently deranged. They were cautioned that the safety of subway passengers was more important than the immediate capture of the fugitive. At 20 minutes to 12, the detail proceeded to the subway station in several squad cars. Patrolmen in uniform were posted out of sight to avoid suspicion. Detectives were posted near the change booth, at turnstiles, and at frequent intervals along the 100-yard underground platform at which the trains pulled to a stop. Other detectives were assigned to board each train as it stopped at the preceding station. We waited. Several locals stopped at the station. Several express trains went through on the inside track. No one resembling the fugitive had gotten off a train by 12.10. Here comes another train, I think, Captain. Looks like an express, Matt. Yes, sir, it is an express. Well, the local shouldn't be far behind it. minutes after. Why? It's 12 minutes after 12. Oh, yeah. Think he's going to show? Ah, uh, it beats me, Matt. Oh, it would beat me worse if John wasn't telling the truth. If he was supposed to meet his brother some other time in some other place. Wait a minute. Here comes the local. Yes. Looks like everybody's set. Better be on this one or the next one if he's coming. Six cars. Not many passengers, Captain. No. Way down there, the last car. Look. Could have been him getting off. That's him. Come on. Come on. He's going to talk to him. Crying out loud. Lou, watch it! Come on. There he is! That way! 
On a track. He jumped on a track. Hello. You all right? He got me with one in the neck. Bring in for an ambulance. Come on, Captain. Bring in for an ambulance. Bring in for an ambulance. He's on a track. Look out, jumping down, Captain. All right. Watch the third rail. There he goes. Hold up there. Hold up. He's crossing over. Watch him. Hold it, Matt. I'll see if I can stop him. Get out! Get out! He's on the down count side. Come on. There he is. Hold up, Mister. Let's cross over, Matt. Watch it, Captain. Downtown Express. You see him? There he is, across the tracks. Get out of the way. Watch the train. See that spark? I saw it. Yep. Threw him ten feet. How'd you make it so fast, Sergeant? Across the track up above. Watch him now. Grab his gun. Got it. Fred. Fred. He's had it, I think. How is it? Everything okay? It's okay. Well, at least one thing, man. What, right, Captain? He did his brother a favor. He won't have to plead insanity in court. Twenty first precinct, Sergeant Waters. Well, where was the car parked? The sixty first and what? Were the doors locked? Well, what kind of a car is it? What year? Well, what's the registration number? Yeah. Yeah. And so it goes. Around the clock, through the week, every day, every year. A police precinct in the city of New York is a flesh-and-blood merry-go-round. Anyone can catch the brass ring. Or the brass ring can catch anyone. 21st Precinct. A factual account of the way the police work in the world's largest city is presented with the official cooperation of the Patrolmen's Benevolent Association, an organization of more than 20,000 members of the Police Department, City of New York. Everett Sloan in the role of Captain Kennelly, Ken Lynch as Lieutenant King. Featured in tonight's cast were Barbara Weeks, Scott Tennyson, Santos Ortega, Larry Haynes, John Sylvester, and Harold Stone. Written and directed by Stanley Niss. Produced by John Ives. Art Hanna speaking. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.